The 1980s saw an influx of noise rock and experimental music in Japan that would take the underground scene by storm. With artists being more brash, courageous, and downright chaotic in their sound and performances. One of the standout groups in this decade was Hana Tarash, a group that formed in 1984 in Osaka and really pushed the norms of what music was at the time. Now, I've said that exact statement quite a bit when talking about the music that we discuss, whether that be Mayhem, Satan Panonsky, or Gigi Allen. And while it may be a true statement when talking about those acts, Hannah Tarash were on a different level entirely. Their performances and music were the embodiment of chaos, and some would say the embodiment of true noise punk in general. The insanity they brought on stage was all a part of the act and the music, and this led to some of the most dangerous and destructive live performances in music history, with one of their most famous moments coming from a show where they literally bulldozed into the back of a building while performing. Believe it or not, that is just a footnote in this band's history. And before we talk about it, let's talk about the history of Hannah Tarash. The band consisted of just two members, guitarist Mitsuru Tabata and frontman Yamantaka Ai. The two actually met at an Einstrutzende Nubaten gig, a German band that were also very experimental in nature and were almost definitely a big influence for Hannah Tarash. In general, it seemed like the duo had a similar music taste and a common goal. Just like their contemporaries, they would implement normal everyday objects into their music. Things like power tools, drills, barrels, saws, and pretty much any strange object they could get their hands on. In a way, it was a liberating concept. Anything that was nearby could be used as an instrument and added to their music. This was definitely apparent in their first album. Hannah Tarash I, otherwise known as Hannah Tarash One. This was the first of three albums that they would create throughout the 80s, the other ones being Hannah Tarash Two and Three. I've listened to all of these albums in full and it was definitely an interesting journey to say the least. Believe it or not, I tried to pick out one of the more musically cohesive moments I could find. But as you can probably tell from that soundbite, there aren't that many. Occasionally throughout the albums, you will hear a drum solo or two and maybe some loose vocals here and there. But besides that, the sounds come from completely random places and it seems like anything can happen at any time. Which was probably the case, as most of these records seem to be off the cuff and improvised. Although there are a lot of compelling and interesting moments, it can be a harrowing thing to listen to. And it seems like something you'd want to see being created instead of hearing it. And when it comes to Hannah Tarash, that is definitely the case. In the world of noise punk, intense live performances are to be expected. The chaotic nature of the genre almost calls for it. But Hannah Tarash were on a different level entirely. There are only a few clips I could find, but they give us a glimpse into the insane world of their live performances. From sticking the microphone in their mouth and screaming at the top of their lungs while the audience just stands there, to actually picking up panes of glass and throwing it in the direction of the audience. One of the more infamous moments happened when the frontman, I, strapped a circular saw to his body during a live gig. He was severely injured because of this and almost sawed his leg in half. In another gig, he brought a dead cat on stage that he found outside and threw it into the crowd. Those few events alone should let you know how dangerous these shows were becoming. Unfortunately, these gigs were not well documented, and most of the insane stories simply come from word of mouth, but the best example you will get from a footage perspective comes from this 30-minute clip titled Hanatara Shibuya Tokyo 1985. The video is obviously low resolution and it's hard to make out what's happening at times, but what we do see is pretty revealing. Slowly but surely, the duo destroy every single fragment of this stage throwing barrels around, ripping up the floorboards, and near the end, they actually start to throw objects directly at the crowd, which seems to be a recurring theme at their live shows. Understandably, the people in the crowd start to quickly leave the premises, and at the end of the video, we see the staff of the venue solemnly clean up the destruction that has occurred. It is a great video, and it's a bit of a hidden gem because it not only shows the intensity of their performances, but it also shows the reality behind what they're doing. At this stage of their career, the crowd were literally signing waivers before they entered the venue that essentially absolved Hannah Tarash of any guilt if anything happened. That's how dangerous these shows were becoming, but they were still drawing in pretty big crowds. People obviously wanted to see what Hannah Tarash were like live, and it was that same year that they had arguably their most infamous performance, and it might be 
fair to say that this was also one of the most insane gigs that ever happened in music history. Although Hana Tarash were based in Osaka, they had played numerous high-profile gigs in the underground clubs of Tokyo and were cultivating a strong audience of people who wanted to see what they were going to do next. Well, they answered that question in a ferocious manner when they performed in a club in the summer of 1985 and bulldozed into the back of the building they were playing at. Although there is no video of this, there is a pretty insane slideshow of pictures that show us the carnage of this show. Yamantaka Ai was actually asked about this experience and he detailed it by saying the following. We got on this thing and rode it, bang, through the doors of the hall. It'll spin a full 360 degrees, so we were spinning and driving through the audience, chasing them around, when suddenly there was this wall we spun into and opened a rather large hole in. The wind came blowing in. The place was all concrete walls and no windows. We smashed everything. It's amazing, really, how little sound comes out of something you're smashing with all your might. So, yes, you heard that correctly, he actually chased the audience around with the bulldozer until eventually he got back on stage and continued his performance. What's interesting about this statement is he did remark on the actual sound. Since that was, in theory, the music that they were performing, it would make sense that he would care about it, but it's also quite comical to think that while he was chasing the crowd around with a literal bulldozer, he was also annoyed that it wasn't loud enough. After they performed on stage for a while, Yamantaka left the stage and entered the crowd. He lit a Molotov cocktail and attempted to throw it onto the stage so that he could fully burn the wreckage that he had just created and potentially burn down the entire building. Luckily, he was restrained, and at this stage, the show ended. The sheer danger and destruction of this gig is on a completely different level than any live show I have ever talked about on this channel. Hannah Tarash almost destroyed this entire building in the name of performance, and put everybody in the audience in severe danger. This wasn't something you simply mopped up and brushed away. This was a costly endeavor, and the duo paid the price. Specifically, 600,000 yen, the equivalent of $9,000. They also lost the privilege to play in Tokyo for 10 years, and when word began to spread about this insane show, they had a lot of difficulty performing anywhere in the country, as most venues were understandably cautious about booking Hannah Tarash. Considering the circumstances, it's not the most severe penalty for such an egregious performance, and it could have ended horribly. If somebody was seriously hurt or killed, the pair could have ended up behind bars, regardless of the waivers that the audience had signed. But amazingly, nobody was hurt and the duo became an infamous act in the underground scene. By all accounts, this was a historic show, and it gave the duo a new title, the world's most dangerous band. And to be honest, they probably earned it. The rest of the 80s were a difficult time for Hannah Tarash, but the 90s were easier when Yamantaka Ai vowed to tone down his insane performances. This led to various different clubs allowing the duo to perform at their venues again, and while some of these shows were a little bit chaotic, nothing would ever compare to the shows that they did in the mid-80s. They truly were a once-in-a-lifetime act, and it's actually difficult to speak about Hannah Tarash from a purely musical perspective, when their live shows are so intrinsically linked to the act as a whole. Japan's noise scene in the 80s and 90s were undoubtedly a genre-defining time, with acts like Merzbau, Hijo Kaiden, and Incapacitants all creating projects that changed the scene. Hannah Tarash were right up there, and even took it to a new level when it came to their live performances. I'll leave two videos linked down below that were created by Pad Chennington. I came across them while I was researching this video, and he does a much better job when it comes to speaking about Japanese noise music from a more academic standpoint. This video was more of a profile piece of Hannah Tarash's early work and their insane live shows, but I hope that doesn't deter you from learning more about the genre as a whole, because regardless of the absolute chaos, it is a fascinating world filled with fascinating musicians. But that's all from me today. I will see you in the next video.